Sage has long been associated with wisdom, with the plant name even applied to those we consider to be wise. And this fantastic plant was sacred to the Romans. Both the Romans and Egyptians preserved meat using sage. Nicholas Culpepper also noted its value to the memory, which is borne out by modern medicine, because sage prevents the breakdown of acetylcholine, which the brain needs to store memories. Now, Culpepper assigned sage to Jupiter, while William Lilly assigned it to Saturn. This doesn't exactly help with its magical uses, since it pops up in spells to increase love and remember loved ones when they pass. So, let's dig into the folklore of sage in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Cedric, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are carrying on with the Folklore of Edible Plants series and we are going to move on to the second plant in the famous refrain, Parsley, Sage, Rosemary and Thyme from Scarborough Fair. I do want to point out before I get started that there are different types of sage and in this particular episode we are going to focus on common sage, which is Salvia officinalis, rather than the endangered white sage, Salvia apiana. And the main reason for that is because common sage is originally from the Mediterranean and is therefore common in Europe where I am, while white sage is only native to the southwestern United States and northwestern Mexico. White sage has of course been over harvested due to somewhat appropriative practices, but because it doesn't grow where I am in northern Europe, we're going to have a look at common sage instead. And common sage, despite the name, is still pretty cool. And it does also come in several sub-varieties as well, one of which we will briefly touch on. But let's start off with some remedies associated with sage. Now, sage's scientific name is salvia, as I said earlier, and this comes from the Latin word salvio, which means to heal or to save. And the officinalis part of sage's botanical name actually comes from the Middle Ages. And English Heritage explained that monks stored their medicines and herbs in an officina or storeroom. And that's where when you see plant names which have officinalis in them, it generally indicates that they were used at some point in apothecary gardens and so on, because they were then stored by these monks. Now, like the Romans, medieval monks did use sage in a host of their remedies, and they used it to cleanse the body and also to whiten teeth. Now, there was one particular remedy of eating sage daily in May, which apparently gave you eternal life, and rubbing fresh sage leaves on warts was thought to cure them. And that's probably not actually the strangest idea, because sage does have some antibacterial properties in them. Now, according to folklore, sage does have the most potency before it flowers, and the ancients apparently also believed that sage could soothe the nerves as well. And it was used as a remedy for St Anthony's fire, egg and heartburn. And to use it in this manner, you were directed to eat seven leaves on seven consecutive mornings before breakfast. And according to plantlaw.com, sage tea was used to help ease headaches and arthritis, while people also use sage leaves as poultices on mouth ulcers or to ease sore gums caused by dentures. And perhaps the simplest remedy only actually needs two ingredients because you can mix black tea leaves and sage to create a hair rinse for dark hair. Although I think perhaps the easiest solution is also that you can make sage tea as a gargle if you've got a sore throat as well. As always, do make sure that these things will work well with any medication that you're currently taking if you do want to internally take any of these hermal remedies. Now, I did mention that sage had some antibacterial properties and they perhaps explain why sage also sometimes appears in the recipe for Four Thieves Vinegar, which we did have a look at once before when we were looking at lavender. And this first appeared in Marseille, where four grave robbers were plundering graves during a plague outbreak. And when they were caught, they claimed that they'd used a special potion to protect them against contracting the plague. There is an alternative version that sees the thieves invent the vinegar after being sentenced to bury plague corpses, but either way, the intention is the same. They plan to use this four thieves vinegar to stave off the plague. Now, if you're interested, their mixture contained lavender, rosemary, distilled vinegar and cloves, but some recipes also say it contained garlic, wormwood or sage. And I think, as I say, because of these antibacterial properties of sage, I can understand why people would put it in there. It does also grow quite profusely as well, so it would be quite easy to get hold of. 
Now, one of the more unfortunate lines that we sometimes find in the folklore of plants is the assignation of plants to one gender or the other. Now, obviously, we do have to remember that this is a throwback to a time when men assumed ascendancy and authority over women. Obviously, I'm talking as if that time's in the past, but there we go. Don't really want to get into politics too much on the podcast, but while these domestic politics don't necessarily hold as much water now, it is worth including them to examine what earlier societies did believe, because I do think that you do need to track changes in belief, because then that lets you see how far you've actually come. But sage was one of those plants whose growth was associated with strong or domineering women, and sage was therefore considered to flourish anywhere where women dominated the household. And indeed, if sage flourished in the garden, there was a belief that the family would only have girls. In one particular line of doggerel ran thus, If the sage bush thrives and grows, the master's not master, and he knows. Now here, the growth of your sage essentially indicates your social status, in relation to your partner in life. So there are some anecdotes about nervous husbands cutting back the sage bushes so as to avoid wagging tongues about their ability to run their household. Christina Oakley Harrington puts forward this, if you identify as a woman and you want to increase your authority, then sage can help. So if you put a sage plant on the kitchen window so that you can then talk to it every day and sort of commune with your sage. And if you tie a purple ribbon around the pot or put it in a purple pot, the colour of rulership, then you'll have a nice boost to your authority there. But as well as conferring a sense of authority, sage also has some links with luck as well. So if you want to bring you some good luck, you can write the names of the apostles on sage leaves and obviously then carry them with you as a good luck charm. But there was also a belief that you should never actually have a full bed of sage because that would bring you bad luck. So basically what you do is you'd have like a partial bed of sage and you then put another plant in alongside the sage. Now, it's weirdly easy to find links between edible plants and death, which in some ways, as you can understand, links between poisonous plants and death, because obviously the link is fairly clear. But then it is really odd when you find a plant like, for example, parsley with its association with Persephone that we saw last week. And then, as we'll see next week, rosemary is also a plant associated with remembrance. And indeed, we'll find the same thing with sage as well. And part of it is because it didn't wither quickly. So it was then used as a remembrance at funerals and mourners might then throw it into the graves as well. And I can only assume that the indication there was the fact that because the sage didn't wither, it was sort of an act of I'll remember you for a bit longer kind of thing. And in April 1662, good old Samuel Pepys travelled to Southampton from Gosport and he noticed a churchyard along the route in which all the graves were sowed with sage. It is interesting that there is this link between sage and funerals, which you possibly don't think about when you're making sage and onion stuffing, but there we go. And weirdly, sage also appears in love spells, and Christina Oakley Harrington notes a somewhat coercive love spell to make someone love you, and you should find three sage leaves, write Adam Eve on one leaf, Jesus Mary on the second leaf, and then your name on the third leaf. And you were directed to grind them up and then put the powder into your intended food or drink. And this would apparently make them love you. Now, obviously, this isn't recommended in any shape or form because coercing someone to love you essentially breaches their free will. And ultimately, do you really want to be with someone where you had to force them into loving you rather than them just thinking you're an absolutely awesome person? That said, it doesn't say this in the book, but I can't help thinking that there'll be nothing stopping you from adding the powder to your own food for a bit of a boost of self-love. Sage leaves also pop up in two time-sensitive rituals which can help you draw a future partner and I think these two are a better option because there's less specific so you're not compelling a specific person to fall in love with you you're just finding out who you're going to end up with. Now again bear in mind that these were designed for women to find out which husband they were going to have due to the social politics of the time, although ultimately I don't see any reason why anybody can't do them because the principle should be the same. But in the first one, you're directed to pick 12 sage leaves at midnight on Christmas Eve to simply see a vision of your future husband. And you're also directed not to damage the bush while doing so, which is going to be a little bit of a, a challenge, but there we go, you can have a go at that one. And in Lincolnshire, people did do the same with red sage and they did it on St Mark's Eve instead. 
Now, we do find this with a lot of these divinatory rituals because you find them on different parts of the calendar. So sometimes they're on St. Mark's Eve, sometimes it's Midsummer's Eve, sometimes it's All Hallows' Eve, Christmas Eve or even New Year's Day. So if you feel, oh no, I can't wait until Christmas Eve to find this out, well then you could probably just wait until Halloween and do it then instead because that's kind of the next famous Eve, as it were, that's coming up. And obviously, if you're listening to this at some other time of the year, then feel free to pick whichever day is nearest to you. But if you do have a little bit more time and you simply want to call in a partner rather than see who the partner will be, then there's this ritual from Yorkshire that you can have a go at. And this one directs you to gather 12 sage leaves at midnight on St John's Eve, which is June the 23rd, which is Midsummer's Eve. And you need to put them in a saucer and then leave that in a drawer until just before the following midnight. Just before 12, open the window and then drop a leaf outside for every stroke of the hour. And this would apparently summon a husband to your home. But like I say, you can probably use that for different partners as well. I think the links with love spells possibly comes from its links with the memory and remembrance. So there are various different ideas about using sage, as I say, to remember people. So obviously remembering who you're in love with could probably be quite a good one. And I do obviously want to go back and just remind you about that refrain in the song Scarborough Fair because that is kind of our framing mechanism for this month's episodes. And in case you didn't hear the parsley one last week, the bouquet that's mentioned in the song obviously contains parsley, sage, rosemary and thyme. And one translation of that does suggest that parsley means I want to have babies with you, sage means I'm dependable rosemary means remember me and time means i'm yours so somebody's then essentially put these meanings together to make a bouquet to send a message and obviously as we've seen with the episode on the victorian language of flowers plant symbolism obviously can be combined within a bouquet so you can send a slightly more sophisticated message or make your point a bit more clearly than just sending a single plant mostly because plant symbolism really varies from one dictionary to another so if you at least put several together you can sort of make your message a little bit more obvious now what i find really interesting here is that sage is considered to mean i'm dependable but it does also have that link with remembrance as well so i think that we can possibly read a couple of other things into that mostly because sage actually represented domestic virtue in the victorian language of flowers and garden sage which is sort of another variety of sage actually represented esteem so another thing that you could be saying with that particular bouquet and rather than saying i'm dependable is kind of also saying like i have domestic virtue so in a way it's saying you're dependable but it's also telling the other person why you would be a good choice as a partner ultimately so i hope that all makes sense you know how much i love the victorian language of flowers and if you are interested in these kind of things i do post a lot of photos of flowers on my instagram where i do then give the meanings of some of the plants as well Now, ultimately, sage is an absolutely fabulous herb and there's a whole range of ways to involve it in your life from simply growing it to using it in teas or obviously eating it because obviously it is a culinary herb. And it is a fantastic herb to use if you want to show a mark of respect to someone who has died. And its links with memory does make it a great plant for remembrance. Now, like I said in the parsley episode, I am not a herbalist, so I wouldn't recommend ingesting any herbal preparations until you know that they're safe for you based on whether you're pregnant or taking any other medication. And that's where things like using something as a gargle or a hair rinse, you should be all right with as long as you haven't got an allergy. But again, just double check that you're fine to have this particular thing before you use it because you don't want to aggravate an allergy or something like that. Now, like I mentioned last week, if you want to learn more about herbalism, then check out the Rowan and Sage website where Sarah's got a range of courses available and you can basically learn from one of the best and most accessible practitioners that I've certainly come across on the interwebs but what i would like to know is what associations do you have with the verse that what associations do you have with this rather versatile plant have you tried growing it do you know any other superstitions or have you actually come across any other folk remedies for using it because like i say plant law's got a few but they all kind of revolve around the same sort of thing so i'd be interested to know if anyone does use sage to soothe their arthritis or handle headaches or indeed for any mouth related issues as well So as always, obviously, please do feel free to get in touch with me if they are things that are relevant to you. The next episode is going to be Rosemary and obviously then the one after that's going to be time. And I did obviously realise after I started this that July actually has five Saturdays and obviously I have four episodes planned. So my last episode is just going to be like a bit of a compendium episode for other 
edible plants like dill and basil and things like that. So we're going to cover a fair few in that final one. So without any further ado, I'm going to let you go and crack on with whatever you were doing now. As always, remember that if you do enjoy the podcast, dropping a review really basically just helps the algorithm of these different platforms then recommend the podcast. And then on top of that, if you do want extra content and there's an absolute bucket load of extra content now on the Patreon, then obviously feel free to sign up and you can get access to all of that as well. But otherwise, have a marvellous week ahead and I will see you soon. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee or you can join the fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.